Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Dennis Craig, Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we move this to an online forum so we can accommodate everyone that's interested. And uh, we're hoping for a productive dialogue today where we can really uh, end up in a place where we talk about next steps after uh, acquainting the community with the issues uh, that we're encountering. Um, I'd like to start uh, by pointing out that if you would like to view closed captions, please click the live transcript button on your Zoom toolbar and select show subtitles. To view a full transcript during the event, please click live transcript and select show full transcript. Um, so uh, now that that uh, part of business is, is completed, uh, we're ready to begin the meeting. Um, I'd like to begin this meeting by saying, um, my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time listening the last week and a half. And a big piece, I think, of the dialogue today is talking about community standards that are reflective of our community, faculty, staff, and students, and represent the conduct, um, the culture, and a feeling of, of safety and ability to all achieve our mission of, of learning. Um, so, so that's really, uh, community standards are reflective of the community in a given place and time. So I think this is a great opportunity to refresh around that and find ways that we can collaborate going forward. Um, it, it, kicking things off, uh, President Millie Pena um, has asked to join us uh, and would like to, to kick things off and get us started. President Pena? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Dennis. And thank you all for coming today uh, and for this opportunity uh, that we have coming together as a community to uh, learn, uh, to, di to dialogue, uh, and also uh, to grow uh, together. And so I'm looking forward uh, to our, uh, what we're going to learn today, also uh, listening, uh, but more importantly, um, out of this process, which I uh, see as a beginning of more things to come, uh, but certainly uh, looking forward to uh, coming together as a community so that we can lay our path forward. And uh, I look forward uh, to the forum and uh, uh, to seeing uh, where this takes us and uh, look forward to working with any, everyone uh, uh, to have us uh, grow uh, as a community. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dr. Pena. Um, so before I begin, I'd just like to talk a little bit about uh, the conduct of the 90 minutes ahead of us. Uh, we're all committed to having civil discourse. We're all very passionate about the issues uh, on campus, the broader issues of our time, uh, but it's extremely important that we, we um, channel our passion into a productive civil discussion. So we'll be moderating questions and answers during this, um, and we'll be adhering to uh, running a meeting in the manner that you'd be uh, comfortable and expected to work upon, uh, just as if you were in a class today. Uh, so with that, I wanted to introduce the panelists and uh, we have speaking points that I think speak to the moment that we're in. Um, I was concerned, I think we were all concerned the past week and a half about uh, information, the community understanding the community standards process and us feeling um, our goal, a shared sense of uh, the expectation uh, that we're applying the code appropriately and equally uh, and that it's reflecting our values. Uh, so with that, let me introduce the panelists uh, who will all have a role, I'm sure, in answering the questions that come our way. Um, I'll start out with uh, Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, Janice Astor. Uh, I think uh, Janice will be very helpful in help talking us through next steps when we all assimilate the information towards the end of the meeting, as will uh, other panelists as well. Uh, Dean of Students, Patricia Bice, uh, is joining us for the discussion. Chief Diversity Officer, Jerima DeWeese. Assistant Director of Human Resources, Ricardo Espinalis. Student Ombudsman, Paul Nicholson. The Director of Office of Community Standards, Tatiana Perez is joining us, as is University Police Chief, Dayton Tucker. Um, so Tatiana, why don't you start with your overview, Student Code of Conduct. Um, and after your intro, uh, for that part of the agenda, we'll go into a question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, thank you to everyone that's joining on the call today. So I would like to start with 
quick overview of the Office of Community Standards to understand the process that um, we oversee. So the Office of Community Standards oversees the student code of conduct and the discipline process at the college. The process is protected by FERPA, which is a federal law that prohibits us from sharing any specific cases associated um, with the discipline history of any student at the college. The office receives reports for various um, constituents at the college that includes university police, office of community standard staff, and faculty and staff as well as students. Once the office receives those reports, we do verify the information and compare it with the um, student code of conduct with regards to college policies and alleged violations of those college policies. The discipline process is an administrative process and it is a three-step process that begins with an initial conference. A hearing is then an option for students that do not agree with decision, decisions made at the initial conference. And the students will have also after a hearing the opportunity of an appeal. So it is a three-step administrative process that ends with the appeal um, portion of the process as afforded by the policies at the college. The code of conduct is separated into appropriate sections and each section does have um, meet the expectations associated with college policies or expectations of the community. Our code of conduct does um, detail progressive sanctioning standards. So, when you are reviewing the code of conduct, you may be able to see that all of our codes or charges associated in the code of conduct um, have a minimum and a maximum. Our minimum at the college is a reprimand and the maximum is expulsion. All for the majority of the code of conduct charges do have a progressive sanctioning standard. And it is the belief of the college and the office to support that progressive sanctioning standard. There are some charges that do not allow for that progressive sanctioning standard because of law, specifically charges associated with sexual and interpersonal violence do require the college to specify um, specific minimum and specific maximums. There are other charges that do not have that larger or expansive um, progressive sanctioning available for the determination being made by initial conference officers or hearing board members. The college has always, and the office has always, um, constantly review charges associated in, with the student code of conduct and continuously reviews that and makes recommendations to moving forward and making any edits as appropriate to the student code of conduct. So I definitely understand and I have heard the concern specifically with um, the E1 charge in the student code of conduct as it not affording a progressive sanctioning standard and the office and the college has began to work on the process that would be required for us to recommend the revision of sanctioning as a, it applies to that code. Another of the concerns that we have heard um, from the office and um, students particularly is the concern with um, sexual interpersonal violence or bias and discrimination reports. I would like to um, explain a little bit about that process as it involves the Office of Community Standards. So the Office of Community Standards certainly receives reports from anybody on campus and we certainly have received reports with alleged violations of sexual interpersonal violence or bias and discrimination. Our process at the college requires that once we receive that report, we submit it to the Office of Diversity and Compliance for review through an investigation. That process um, takes its course and once if it is determined that the allegations received in the report and confirmed through an investigation do stand for violation of the code of conduct, then that report will be forwarded back to the Office of Community Standards for adjudication under the student code of conduct. Jarima, um, would you like to expand on the sexual interpersonal violence policy at the college? Sure. So um, part of the purview of the Office of Diversity and Compliance 
is uh, Title IX and also affirmative action. So in my role as CDO, I overview and oversee um, DEI initiatives and um, strategies that's happening at the college. So specifically for um, Title IX, we are charged with being in compliance with the Title IX regulation. Most recently on August 14th of 2020, a new Title IX regulation has been put into place. Um, on our Title IX website, it explicitly lays out the process, but I will just summarize it here very quickly for, um, for um, matters of information. We receive reports and we receive it in several ways. Um, Anyone can make a report, any individual can make a report directly to our office by calling or sending an email or even stopping by our office. If something is reported to University Police Department, we are in contact and communication with the University Police Department and we receive reports that way as well. Additionally, we receive reports, I'm sorry. We, additionally, we can receive reports from uh, the Office of Community Standards or bystander reports or faculty reports. Um, anonymous reports are also a way of, of us receiving this information. Once there is um, a report or inquiry made to our office, we are then responsible for reaching out to those individuals or identified named parties to start conversation. In the initial conversation, we determine what has happened what is being reported and to get a sense of what next steps we will take. With regard to the Title IX regulation, we are to follow due process rights. Every party, any named party has due process rights. So we then proceed through a process determining if the investigation will be formal, informal in, its, um, in, in the process. When we conduct an investigation, it's a thorough, comprehensive fact-finding investigation. We, we uh, accept documentation. All named parties are uh, available and asked to provide that information. Um, so emails, documents, sometimes camera footage, sometimes text messages, sometimes social media scrubbings, um, sometimes in-person uh, interviews. These are all ways that we utilize to conduct an investigation. When looking at Title IX uh, matters, we're looking for any discriminatory violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, um, intimate relationship, inappropriate behavior, sexual misconduct, um, things of that nature, just to name a few. When the investigation is taking place, the named involved parties, meaning the complainant and the respondent are provided updates as they ask. All named parties are also afforded an advisor. If there is not an advisor named, we can provide an advisor for you as part of the process. The advisor works with their particular represented party to work with us in conducting the investigation. By law, we can only inform the, the named parties involved. We cannot provide information, um, detailed information to parents, um, concerned parties, outside entities. The information is relegated to the named parties. Um, after an investigation is taken place, we then again, meet with the named parties to, to, to express to them what our investigation have concluded. If things rise to the level that there is a potential violation of the Title IX regulation and adjudication is necessary, we then move that case or that matter to the Office of Community Standards. If the, um, if the incident or if the matter determines that, you know, something inappropriate uh, something inappropriate occurred, we in the Title IX office, but it has not risen to the level of a Title IX infraction, we in the Title IX office can talk to both parties to think about or discuss potential informal resolutions. Um, and so that's just the Title IX process in a nutshell. Um, I think uh, 
uh, Dennis wanted to speak a little bit about the process as well. Yeah, well, thank you, Jarima. So uh, we do plan to open this up to questions and answers, and we can already see your questions pouring in. Uh, reacting to some of them, this is a first meeting. We shifted this meeting to Zoom, uh, very concerned that we would not all fit in the humanities building. And we certainly wanted to avoid um, any potential of closing people out of this discussion. So when we talk about next steps, we are very much interested in in-person, having an in-person dialogue. Uh, and doing that, I think, is a given. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of questions that have accumulated. Uh, Barry Pearson and Patty Bice uh, are coming through uh, the questions that are coming up, and we're going to direct um, some of the questions um, to the right panelists. So why don't you go ahead with that? You're, you're, uh, Dennis, you're asking about the, the questions that are coming up? Is that what you're talking about? Well, one question was one out the pack. The PAC oh. is under renovation right now due to uh, having to replace all of the fire curtains. So we're not allowed to have audiences in there that would take up seating. So it's, that's, that's factual, and we can verify that for you through our records at facilities management. The other piece of the question is, um, rightfully so, you know, this, this doesn't, it's not the best forum for discussion, but we were trying to lay the groundwork with sharing information that we want to make sure that the, all the community has. One of the questions that has come up is the issue, Dayton, about our concern around safety and how do we make the campus safe? I think it be, would be good if you walk through our safety measures and, and how, what, what kinds of things we do on a regular basis. Sure. <clears throat> hey, um, first I wanna kind of give, you know, a little preference to UPD and give a sense of what we do. Uh, University Police is the campus uh, law enforcement um, and we respond and take reports of uh, illegal activity on campus, but we also um, uh, enforce the campus code. Um, I just want to make everyone clear that the criminal complaints um, that we do take may be referred to the district attorney office for adjudications at the Harrison Town Court. Okay, um, if students do file reports with UPD, um, one of the questions that officers generally will ask the students, and, and it's very important for us to move forward with the case, is uh, are students willing to press charges? I think that's important for people to, to, to take note of um, in regards to um, incidents that happen on campus when it's um, um, incidents in relation to two people, two students. Um, <clears throat> if students are willing to, are willing to press um, charges, the investigation will pursue. And if there's reasonable cause for, 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 um, for criminal charges to, to be presented, um, university police will present um, those charges to um, the district attorney. Um, it's important. It's also important for everyone to know that university police has discretion um, in relation to low-level offenses. Um, what that means is that, <clears throat> in lieu of uh, criminal charges for certain offenses, um, university police will um, and can uh, refer incidents to student affairs. Uh, some examples of that is uh, is uh, drug offenses and also certain low level weapons offenses and, and, uh, and other things that may not relate directly to um, person to person uh, violence. Um, with that said, all university police reports are forwarded to student affairs for follow up. Um, so incidents um, may um, end up in the conduct process, counseling, or Title IX. Um, but just want everyone to realize that you know UPD has basically a few different um, options in dealing with cases. And I wanted to point out that generally, um, cases revolving students, uh, low-level cases are always um, uh, sent through the conduct process um, via student affairs. Um, <clears throat> also want to add, just to kind of give you a sense of, you know, um, UPD and, 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 and what we're guided by and, and who do we, um, you know, how do we interact with the community. Um, as you know, we do many community events, but I did want to point everybody out to point out our uh, personal safety committee webpage. I want to share my screen really quickly.
Okay. So what the personal safety committee is, it's a committee made up of three students, three staff and three faculty. Um, the committee works with uh, UPD to assess the quality of safety and assist us with the development of safety policies, but also reviewing uh, university police policies. Um, I did want to share this website because, I mean, I think they did a really great job working on it. Um, it kind of lays out some information that, you know, we are talking about here um, without, uh, you know, going through all of the information. But <clears throat> um, again, this is uh, a group of uh, three faculty, three staff, three students who work with UPD to um, work on safety. Um, they have, there's a way to contact them to, to, to share safety concerns. Um, but it's the way we work with the community to make sure that, you know, things that we're doing um, and things that we're looking to approve that we can do it with community insight. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, you know, it takes you to links to file reports. It gives you information about sexual assaults. Um, it gives you information about uh, reporting, reporting a violation of the code of conduct. Um, literally, it goes through a lot of things. It talks about if you witness a crime, it talks about if you need to report a sexual assault, um, discrimination, or harassment. It talks about, um, it, it links to uh, the uh, ombudsman's office for students. It even tells you how to, uh, how to report a problem with a campus uh, shuttle. Um, but again, this committee works with us. Uh, we meet regularly, generally once a month, um, and we kind of talk to them about issues across campus. And they help us to, you know, create better access to, you know, information um, and things of that nature, and also programming for students. Um, some of the things that we do, um, we provide uh, twenty-four hour escorts on campus. Um, if someone is in need of, of of a safety escort because they do feel unsafe, um, twenty-four hours a day, we can have um, a member of UPD or a member a member of our community service team uh, walk you across the campus. And the other thing that we do have blue light phones and you'll notice that we've replaced dozens of the blue light phones um, to uh, a brighter, um, a more visible system. Um, if you are concerned about your safety, you're concerned about a suspicious person, please call university police at any time day or night, we will send someone and respond. Um, and to talk about that, um, you know, we respond to suspicious persons on a regular basis. Um, we, will in, we will intercept that person um, and we will, um, <clears throat> you know, in some cases we may um, issue them a persona non grata, meaning they can't return to campus. If they have some affiliation with campus or if it's just a person who, who doesn't belong on campus, we may issue them um, a trespass. Um, one of the other things we do, I just want to point out, you know, we do that uh, Friday, Saturday, um, uh, checkpoint at the at the main gate. Um, that's been very important. That's been a, a major problem uh, reduction on the campus for many, many years. Um, and then lastly, I do want to point out that two other things in relation to transparency um, that I can also thank the personal safety committee for kind of helping us to establish and we continue to work with them. Um, and in fact, I want to mention that there are some openings for students because um, we had two of our students graduate last year. Um, but the person, the personal safety committee was very uh, instrumental in helping us uh, deploy body cameras. Um, if, you, if you don't know, the university police officers do have body cameras. Um, we think it is very important when it comes to transparency with police. Um, also, the, unit, the, um, the personal safety committee was very instrumental in helping us um, refine our complaint uh, procedure. Um, and again, if you go to our website, you can file a complaint or actually, um, you can actually uh, commend an officer if you had a good um, experience with an officer uh, directly on our website. And, and I'm very proud of that because we one of the only police departments that have that ability um, to follow up with a complaint. Uh, we will reach out to you and meet you in a, in a mutual location of your, of your choice. Um, so again, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the community safety community um, safety committee for assistance with that. Um, other than that, again, we're here 24 hours a day. If you need us, uh, don't hesitate to dial 911 or 6911. Thank you. Um, they talk. Or make, 
Go, go ahead, Barry. Maybe you're going to ask. A lot of questions about um, why we can't talk about specific cases. Can you re remind everybody about what we um, are bound by law in terms of FERPA? And then, um, Ricardo, perhaps you could talk about our issues around employees and what we can and can't say. Patty, you want to talk about FERPA? Uh, sure. Um, a, um, a disciplinary uh, process and also um, a Title IX are uh, protected educational records. Um, so they are records that can be shared with the student, but not um, with uh, others. So um, it's not any different um, essentially than grades, which are protected by FERPA uh, and can't be shared um, with others. Uh, disciplinary records cannot be um, shared um, or discussed uh, with others. So. Okay. Ricardo, with given uh, employee relations and, and the like, uh, I think we're bound by the same principle, right? Yes. When, um, when cases come to human resources, Human Resources looks into the case. We conduct our own investigations when it comes to dealing with issues with an employee. Uh, we don't comment, publicize um, what the results of those um, uh, issues are across campus, just like I think community uh, standard doesn't publicize the results of the, with the students, but um, we don't comment on the, the nature of the investigation outside of uh, uh, department and, and we don't publicize uh, that information, but we do conduct internal investigations when it's related to an employing staff. And there are a range of sanctions just as there are with students. Yes, there are a range of sanctions. We follow the, the, the protocols within the union contracts and the policies. Um, the ranges of sanctions can be anywhere from counseling, uh, uh, letters of reprimand, suspensions, fines, up to termination. Uh, I also just wanted, I see there's one question about college officials can't discuss it, but in um, trying to find it now, but in an open forum, others could d discuss it. And, and certainly, you know, if a student wants to share with others um, about the incident, they certainly can. Um, the issue though is, is that the college cannot discuss the information um, that, that we have gathered through the conduct process. Um, so we can't really, um, you know, just dis discuss other information that we are aware of. Um, but certainly, you know, you know, students can talk about it with others if they would like. Um, I think there's a question, um, Dayton, with uh, in terms of uh, the number of weapons on on campus. The Cleary, uh, the annual Cleary report lists crimes, right? It it does. And so the Clary report is on our web and I, I think we, you can get prior years as well. Absolutely, it, it lists just three, the three years of, of, of crimes and, um, and also um, uh, certain student um, related uh, judicial. The other, Go ahead, the, other question, the other question that's come up is that anybody that reports is that that report is taken at safe face value and treated like any other report. I think Tatiana, what's missing is what is it? How is the report? Once you receive a report, what are the steps that you go through uh, to investigate, look at it on balance? And I, and I think similar question for Jarima as well. Sure. So once the office receives a report, um, we do call the people involved in that report. Um, the names are, are provided in that report. Many times is one person, other times is a variety of different individuals. We call those individuals in or that individual in for an initial conference meeting. Um, at that opportunity, the person is able to provide any information they have of the report that has been received. Um, and then the process will move forward with that information. So many times that if depending on the information received, there is an opportunity to quote unquote, pause the conversation so that more questions can be asked, whether that is returning back to university police and asking them more questions about that report, or I mean, 
the report writer as a whole, whether that be a university police officer or that be a resident assistant or a resident coordinator and ask them more questions about that report. Um, if there aren't any more questions about that report, the, off, the initial conference meeting is a non-binding meeting, so students do have the ability to decline any information with regards to a finding and sanctioning at that meeting and choose to go to a hearing. And then in the hearing, students are given the opportunity to provide their own witnesses, um, as well as be accompanied by an advisor of choice of their choosing. That could be anybody that they deem appropriate, as well as have the opportunity to ask questions of the individual or individuals that wrote the report that was submitted to the Office of Community Standards. Thanks. Uh, let me just jump in really quick uh, and mention two things. You know, one, there are 356 participants in this meeting. So uh, clearly uh, we respect and appreciate, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the concern. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we do want an in-person dialogue. So let's be committed before this meeting um, ends to determine how best to do that, given the level of interest and other constraints. Uh, and I just wanted to mention very briefly, going back to the code of conduct, uh, when just one of us um, doesn't behave properly, it affects the whole community. So uh, someone had logged in and is had in, uh, as an imposter uh, pretended to be one of the panelists. That's not okay. People noticed it. Uh, they asked me to bring it up and mention it, and I'm doing so. Thank you. The... Um... I think one of the questions has to do with, I want to return back to a topic that's perhaps been missed. Patty, I think one of the things that we've realized in talking through with students this week is that some, a couple of areas of the code of conduct lack uh, uh, similarities in terms of progressive sanctioning. And that I think one of the things that's really important is to acknowledge at this in this meeting that the, the voices of those students um, that pointed out the issue around progressive sanctioning, the lack thereof, have been heard. Hence, our, our discussion with College Council and, and others last night. Is that fair? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so, you know, in hearing from students um, uh, last week, um, some individually, some in, in, in a group, um, we, we have, um, you know, gone back to try to um, see about reviewing this particular sanction, which is weapons, which is one of the few that starts, um, as mentioned, at the minimum of suspension. Um, uh, the student that many uh, of you are mentioning, um, uh, you know, the um, the sanction was put in uh, abeyance for now, and we are. Um, working through processes to see uh, about adjusting that um, sanction so that it could be more progressive. So um, we've had discussions about it and we continue, there's certain processes that we have to go through and approvals we have to have to be able to make that adjustment. Um, but we're working through those and um, right now um, the sanction is in abeyance. A lot of questions about the definition of a weapon and uh, our, our um, uh, need or desire to, to be clear about that. The difference between a weapon and something that's related to self-defense. I don't know, Chief Tucker, if you want to address that or, or if you can. Uh, sure. So so there's a list, and, and I don't know the entire list off my head, and some, some of the things in the list are things that, you know, we may have never heard of, but there's a list um, that, that the campus follows, follows, and they also follow it in relation to judicials. Um, the list is in the penal law. It's, um, it's on the criminal possession of a weapons fourth. Um, you know, even though it's just list, it's a list of what is uh, considered to be a weapon in New York State, so... It lists things from firearm all the way down to like a, a blackjack or, or brass knuckle, just so you know. Right. But we've also seen examples of other things that were turned into weapons, correct? Yeah. yeah yes. And there's been various, you know, throughout the years, various um, 
charges of weapons of you know various types. Um, I think um, as we um, uh, begin, uh, you know, start to have more discussions um, uh, around um, what we all agree should be our community standards and, and our values on campus, and um, perhaps uh, making some adjustments to ensure that there's more progressive sanctioning. We'll also look at um, you know the weapons that E1 weapons. Do we need it defined more? Um, you know, or do we need it more open because various things could be used as weapons? Um, so we, we want it to be as transparent as possible, still with understanding that things that we don't normally think of uh, as weapons could be used um, as weapons. Okay. Dennis, I don't know if you want to move to the next topic at this point. Thanks, Barry. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we have the opportunity to comb through the comments, uh, the Q&A rather, there's uh, 230, and we'll have an opportunity to, to soak that in and, and talk through next steps. But uh, right now, I think specific um, feedback, um, our panelists are, are free to speak up about next steps, uh, given what we've listened to from in-person conversations over the last week and a half, uh, as well as the chat that's here. Uh, again, um, I apologize for the frustration of finding a right way to engage with, you know, 365 participants. I certainly do feel we need to, to find a more effective way to communicate. Uh, and for me, at least, um, this discussion represents a, a lot of pent up feelings and um, uh, ideas and concerns that uh, need to be addressed on an ongoing and a regular basis. So. You know, let me ask, how can we best uh, regularize this dialogue um, and be able to kind of uh, chart a path ahead into meaningful next steps? Well, Dennis, can I start? Yeah, go ahead. Thank so um, in speaking about next steps, I, I want to just say that um, what we all heard from the students over these last couple of weeks, several different topics, and I'll just connect those topics to next steps. We, we heard that there needs to be um, a, a safe space or a space where students can gather, talk, and talk about issues that they're facing, you know, individually and as a community, um, specifically students of color. So in terms of next steps, the multicultural center is going to be reopening, is going to be relaunching. We're gonna utilize that space to allow for that dialogue and that uh, cohesiveness and synergy to take place in the students' groups. What, we, what else we heard um, um, from students last week and over the last week and a half is wanting to have an understanding of you know, what we as a college are doing to ensure their safety on this campus. Um, working with UPD, Working within the working within our defined codes of conduct and you know regulations in terms of Title IX, we are looking at patterns. We are looking at things that may have been reoccurring. We are trying to identify more closely what is happening and why is it happening. Um, we're looking at patterns of you know is it a particular area that is uh, causing distress? Is it a particular um, space, time, characteristic that's causing um, distress or dysfunction. In terms of us looking and moving forward next steps, our new diversity, equity, and inclusion plan calls to, um, and, and, and that plan, that writing, that writing uh, team is a cross-representative group of staff and faculty, students we're working with cabinet to talk about just what we said here. And that is we're going to look and review all policies and procedures that are on this campus. Policies and procedures drive our practices. So we're going to, we're committed to reviewing all those policies and procedures to, to determine if there's any remnants or presence of bias or discrimination in those rules, policies and procedures, and then remove them so that our practices are being um, implemented from uh, policies that are free from any bias or discriminatory language in its essence. Um, I think it's very important to say that myself and my colleagues are working towards moving away from uh, 
any barriers of uh, discrimination, bias, or um, that impedes upon the free will of the community. In doing so, we as a community need to further commit that we are going to do this civilly, we're going to do this in a respectful manner, and we're going to do it in a way that is understandable for all of us to thrive. And so that in particular, the call to action plan that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has, we're moving forward with that. We're, the, we're finalizing or in the final stages, I should say, of crafting the new diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. We're working with the DEIC. We're working with different governance structures to ensure that that plan is action oriented and speaks to us as a community walking the walk of being inclusive and accessible and safe. So um, that's all that I wanted to say. There's a question in the chat about the blackface incident in the Conservatory of Dance. So let me address that very directly. The faculty member in question has been uh, put on an alternative assignment for the week to give us time to understand uh, the, the context of the photographs and their circumstances and to work towards a solution. Um, understandably, the, uh, the photographs have created anxiety and anger and um, it needs to be addressed. So um, that's, where, that's where it is right now. That's where the situation stands right now. And myself, Jerima, Director Nellie Van Bommel and others are working as quickly as we can uh, to move to uh, acceptable solutions. The trolls that are in the chat, we're moving, we're moving them as quickly as we can. I, I wanted to answer uh, one, one question. Um, it uh, looks like it's from May Russell um, asking why we don't have a black student, student union. Um, students uh, could form one. Uh, I would encourage you, um, if, if there's interest in doing that, to contact uh, Candace uh, White in um, the Office of Student Engagement. Um, she is li the liaison with PSGA this um, semester, and, and there is a process to start um, a club or if you want to start a Black Student Union. Uh, Luna, the alternative assignment keeps him out of the classroom. Uh, uh, it, until such time as we're, we have a solution. I wanted to add in terms of the student code of conduct and the information that um, needs to be reviewed and will be reviewed. Um, we do welcome the information. I see from the chat that there is a lot of information that is unclear to students. So in that information gathering um, process, I do invite students, faculty or staff members that have read the Student Code of Conduct and do have information um, with regards to that to submit that information to us should you feel um, that you are willing and able to do so um, from the office, we would be moving forward with looking at specifically, again, like it was mentioned before, the, the code that was in question here, but also the student code of conduct as a whole. Should there be more information added to the website that would make information clearer? Obviously that also is welcomed by the office so that we can review um, and expand on that information that would make it clear, um, clearer for everybody that has questions about that. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to also for understanding that we do have members of the community and student conduct board. We have student faculty and staff. If you feel that you are hearing from other students, other colleagues um, and want, to share that information as always in our trainings and discussions after meetings. Um, please feel free to share that information with us so that we can work together on collecting that information, reviewing the information and making the changes that um, would need to be made. Let me just uh, jump in again really quick. Uh, so. Uh, PSGA president Nick Astor uh, joined us. Initially, there was a conflict. So, uh, you know, Nick, we were able to, to get you in as a panelist. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, any perspective that you have on having conversations 
working forward discussions with student government or any observations. I'm not putting you on the spot, but uh, just feel free to chime in. Uh, I could see you on video now. Um, okay, I'll say a few words. Um, I've just been uh, combing through the chat and there's a lot of um, confusion. Um, and so I wanna offer my email if you have any other follow-up questions and there's stuff like that about the student code of conduct. Um, we are looking at the student code of conduct in a, in a kind of separate manner. We are gonna have meetings about that and the PSG is gonna do our job combing through it. So if you're interested in kind of looking at the student code of conduct, um, seeing how we could look at certain parts of it and kind of work together as a community to change it for the better, um, I think you could send me an email. We could kind of set up a meeting for that and that kind of stuff. Personally, as a student, I think that there needs to be room in the code of conduct for like more advocacy in terms of like the student's first interaction about their, when an issue arises, they go to uh, the conduct office. And I think that there should be kind of more inclusion in kind of, when the advocate steps in, probably as early as possible, because I know that you can have an advocate during your hearing, but I think someone should maybe step in before. Um, and I think that I know that in terms of like the review board is made up of, if the student chooses to have more than one person in the board, it's made up of a student, a faculty member, and the staff, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Tatiana. I think that we should maybe have something similar like a team of advocates that are already familiar with the code of conduct, because I know that a lot of students, the first time they interact with the code of conduct is when the office reaches out to them, right? And so I feel like having someone who knows the code and is familiar with it to talk to the student, kind of attached to the, um, attached to the, code of conduct office, but like not necessarily directly linked to it would, I think, give an open space for discussion, which I think students would feel more comfortable in my opinion. But um, of course the chat or the Q&A can correct me if I'm wrong in all of this. Um, but of course my email is always uh, nicholas.astropurchase.edu. You could always reach out to me there. I get a lot of emails, but I promise I will get back to you. Thank you. Uh, Nick. I'm sorry, go ahead, Patty. Well, I was just gonna say, yeah, th thanks um, uh, for that, Nick. And, um, you know, as um, we've had uh, some initial discussions, but we de definitely wanna partner with the community and um, reevaluating this. I mean, that there are some uh, opportunities for the advocate in there, but maybe there's, uh, you know, other ways that we can um, branch this out, or, you know, maybe we have some training and have some student advocates that are, um, you know, knowledgeable and well-versed to, to support students in that way. Um, but I, I would, right now, what we have all available also, which it, it, as you're pointing out, students may not always be uh, aware of this or take advantage of it, but Paul Nicholson is our ombudsman. And um, Paul, could you just um, speak a little bit about um, your role um, with, the, with the conduct specifically? Yeah, Nick, th again, thanks for, for bringing up those points. Uh, my name is mentioned in the initial charge letter that a student gets, uh, and the college recognizes that that can be a very frightening thing to get a letter. So they have my name on there as ombudsman, as a third party that the student can speak with, not attached to the conduct office, as you mentioned, but stopping short of being an advocate, not really an advocate for the student, but I can help clear up college policy, um, give them advice, uh, explain what the students can expect as the next step in the disciplinary process. So not involved in the process, uh, have no influence on the outcome of the process, but here as a source of support, as a source of a resource for the students. Yeah, and, I mean, right, right now with what we have in place, I hope students will be encouraged to take advantage of Paul. I'm not sure how many do. Uh, but until we have other um, discussions and other things in, in pro, uh, um, progress or process, um, Paul's a great resource. And let me just add to uh, Janice Astor chairs uh, college's diversity, equity, inclusion committee. Um, I, I asked, we asked uh, uh, 
Dr. Astor to join us to, to speak a little bit about too, the, the role of that uh, committee and any thoughts or ideas in soaking up the feedback from this conversation on, on some possible next steps, uh, I think, which is an essential question for all of us. Yes, I think um, we really need to have an in-person meeting where students can be seen and heard. So I would encourage us to try to schedule that at, you know, sooner rather than later. And regarding the code of conduct, I, you know, I think we should look at um, the issue. I, I like Nick's uh, suggestion about advocacy, of, you know, having advocates uh, somehow figure into the process. I also think that we could really benefit from looking at some other college campuses where they have a model of restorative justice. And that seems to be a lot uh, fairer and more equitable, uh, a fairer and more equitable way of, of uh, holding students accountable um, and, and also, um, you know, having consequences for certain disciplinary actions. So um, those, those are the two things that come to mind. But honestly, I'm just um, trying to listen today and reading all the uh, comments in the Q&A. And it's clear that we need to do a better job of, of seeing and listening to our students. Thank you. Back to, to questions. Uh, it's 2.23, we have some time uh, to talk. And, um, you know, Barry, Patty, is there uh, questions that we could keep on addressing here? Well, I, I know, well, I, I just saw one from Aiden. Now I just lost it, Aiden. I'm sorry, I missed the last name asking about the racist comments um, on, the, uh, on this Q&A and uh, as it relates to the code of conduct. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it would be a violation of the code of conduct, but I'm not sure that we're able to tell who people actually are um, on this. Tatiana, do you have any thoughts about, I mean, it seems like there's people posing as other people. Right. I think that we can certainly follow up. The webinar is um, overseen by CTS. Should they have the ability to track down the IP addresses of those that have been identified as the trolls, um, we will be requesting for CTS to submit that information um, so that the office can follow through accordingly. Thank you. Any final, any final thoughts? Well, I just, in there, uh, Madeline Elam, I think just responded based on what uh, Tatiana was saying. Yes, um, they will investigate. We, um, if we're able to get IP addresses and identify the students that will be investigated as all, as all incidents that are reported to community standards are. Um, is there kind of a process in which people whose questions weren't answered could get their questions answered? One of the things that's come become very clear is the desire to speak in person, no doubt about it. I think the, the chat and the, the Q&A will form the basis for uh, being sure that in the future, when we, when we do meet in person, that the, the, the topics that the students want to talk about are front and center pulled from the chat. Um, I see a number of them. One, going forward, being more practiced in just meeting in person and talking through these issues and trying to find venues for that to happen on an ongoing basis. The, the concern and, and clear concern about how we're um, working through uh, the judicial process on both the student side and the faculty uh, staff administration side. And that what we have a lot of work to do is to help build understanding of what we can and can't do. Um, in terms of employment law, student conduct. So that's 
that's part of it. The other part that's really loud and clear is that the students want to speak. And um, that's something that we've got to clearly create a menu for. And feeling unheard is something that um, is, is a part of this and that we've got to accept um, and correct. The other part of it I'd say is that it's important to be mindful that we're still all learning how to live together again after COVID. And I think this is a part of that. No excuse, it's just a part of it. Um, and we will. Um, I think safety clearly is something that um, we need to get to the root cause of. Why are people, what's causing people to feel unsafe? Who are the actors in that? And, and what are the actions we can take? I, those, are the, those are the next steps that I think are um, uh, very clear uh, for us to, to, to talk about, work, work with students on, uh, and not, uh, not alone. You're muted, Thank Dennis. You. Yes, uh, thanks, Barry. I appreciate that summary. Um, you know, one thought that I have is that you know, we I'm happy to organize uh, in-person forums that, that maybe they could be held in different locations, um, so everyone has time to to um, so students have time uh, and the ability to speak. Um, again, navigating a conversation with this many participants. Uh, is going to be a challenge, but we could find ways to uh, better address that than we did today. Um, do our panelists have any other final thoughts? I, I would like to um, find time uh, while all of this is fresh in our heads to really carve out uh, some next steps, as I discussed earlier. Uh, and again, I know this wasn't the ideal way for all of us to be meeting, um, uh, but I, I certainly uh, got a lot out of it uh, listening and helping formulate you know, the path ahead over the rest of the semester and some time to come. Well, Dennis, I, I'd just like to, um, I guess, reiterate, um, you know, that I would like to um, first and foremost um, address um, the um, sanctioning with the uh, weapons um, charge so that we, you know, can finalize um, any type of uh, cases that were um, from this semester. But then, but then moving forward as we're, um, hopefully have some in-person discussions, um, perhaps uh, a task force, um, you know, students, uh, faculty and staff um, to, to look at um, other uh, colleges code of conduct as Janice, you know, was um, mentioning. We do have that we are part of a SUNY uh, uh, conduct um, system. So they, they have training and those kinds of things um, with that as well. Um, but to really, um, after this initial step in addressing this um, one code, which doesn't seem to, the sanction for it doesn't seem to match our values at this time, that then we take um, some time um, to make adjustments, uh, which is a much lengthier process. So, you know, it will be, uh, I think, a process that we should try to wrap up um, by maybe March or something. Um, uh, of next year, it will, it will have to go through college council. We'll also have to be vetted by our legal council. Um, so it is quite a, um, you know, a undertaking, uh, but I think um, us working together, we can really, um, really make um, more improvements in the direction that, that we're hearing um, that Janice is talking about and that we're hearing from students. Thank uh, you. The petition for Big House, it's been received, correct? I don't. Name big. I, I, Nick, is that the case? Nick, is there a petition that re, to rename? I heard of a petition, heard, but it has not gone through the PSGA. I've just heard that, of it. Is that, the, is that the place it should go? Um, that, we we can draft a petition and send it to you guys if you believe that's the proper channel. I'm but just they, asking if if there has been one to you, and you're saying there hasn't. There has not. To me directly, no. I, I do think that would be a good avenue to go through PSGA, you know, if there is consensus. I, I guess I only heard about it. I don't know if I heard, I heard something about it, but I, I haven't seen a petition either. If so, if, before the, yeah, if PSGA takes that up, there is a definite route uh, to respond to it. Um, 
and to discuss it and to involve the right people and, you know, to be somewhat educational in terms of, you know, what the policies are and what the um, resources are available in engaging discussions about renaming buildings, um, you know, which, you know, has some complications to it, but certainly doable. And it's, it's a discussion we're very open to have. Okay. Um, can I just uh, say some final words, like, on the PSJ's behalf, I think that just based on what you were saying, Dennis, and based on what I'm just coming through the questions here, a lot of different people have kind of different definitions of safety. People of color might have a different definition of safety. The LGBTQ community has a different definition of safety. We have to make sure that in these meetings, I know that it's hard to find students a lot of times for the committees that often end up making these decisions. But I think that it's important that we include as many people as we can um, and try to define that and maybe talk a little bit about now what our definition of safety is for the campus community. I think that would be good. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. I think uh, our work together and um, getting back to the community with next steps from this discussion and others yet to come, uh, for me personally, will be part of the follow-up from today. So, so thank you. Okay. Um, but again, I, I'd like to, to mention this is the, you know, this is the, uh, I think for a lot of us, uh, finding a path together uh, to continue the dialogue. Um, we will go back and look at the questions that were submitted um, to help us with our planning and to help with future communications. Uh, I thank all of our uh, panelists for stepping into this. I know it, it probably for many felt like an eternity between um, conversations of last week and today, Tuesday. Uh, we all know it's very challenging to, to get us all together um, and to get in the right mode uh, to be able to talk through all these issues. So I thank you all panelists um, and uh, I appreciate everybody check, uh, coming together today like we did. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you. Take care everyone, thank you.